Take two. One of my all-time favorite Bible heroes is John the Baptist. Uh, For you that don't know a lot about John, um, let me tell you, he was kind of a freak. Um, Like many of you, he was a child of the desert with dark leathery skin and a wardrobe made out of the same thing, plus his primary diet intake was locusts and wild honey. RFK Jr. would have gone ballistic on this cat. All he ate was bugs and sweets, bugs and sweets. No wonder the elite said he was unstable. So he's stomping around the desert, all leathered up, untamed dreads, bugs in his teeth, plus a bad case of the shakes from eating nothing but honey. Plus, he's always yelling. Did you notice that? What's he yelling? Repent! That dude caused such a ruckus. The authorities, they tried to stop him, but they couldn't. And you know why? Because John was sent from God. That's why. Sent as God's personal messenger, as God's chosen voice, calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Well, one day, John's standing beside the Jordan River, doing his messenger thing, preaching that same one-word sermon, repent. Why, John? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But not even John knew just how at hand God's kingdom was, because as he's preaching, John looks up, here comes Jesus. Why did Jesus come while John was so close to the Jordan? Because he wanted to be baptized by John. So they go down into the water, and when Jesus came up out of the water, the Bible says at that moment, heaven opened, and Jesus saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And then a voice from heaven, understand, this is the Father of Jesus speaking, and he said to Jesus, this is my Son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Although, this is a far better translation, in whom my pleasure rests. That translation not only is more accurate, it speaks to the Father's permanent pleasure, his lasting pleasure, not a fleeting sort of pleasure that we tend to feel when our kids do something that make us proud, as opposed to other times. That's momentary pleasure, but God is declaring his resting pleasure, a pleasure not based on performance or situational pride. God the Father wasn't pleased just because Jesus got baptized. His pleasure was an abiding pleasure, kind of like what you feel when your baby is napping and you just kind of drink in the love, right? Well, when Josh was, I don't know, maybe 10 or so, he and I were playing burnout, where, you, you, you know, burnout, you, you throw the ball just as hard as you can. Well, Josh fired one at me, and when I caught it, the leather of my mitt cracked, and my hand started to sting, and I looked at my son with resting pleasure. And here's why. Because I flashed back even farther than that moment, back to when I bought him one of those Velcro gloves. Do you you remember those? Where as long as dad can kind of hit that thing, the ball's going to stick. Well, we used that for a while until I decided it was time for Josh to have a legit glove. Trouble is, at first, My son couldn't even catch a cold. (laughs) And he got so upset at himself, he burst into tears, ran inside, and hid his mitt in the closet. Didn't touch it for weeks. Until one evening, I said, Josh, let's go play catch. He wasn't keen about that, but I showed him how to hold the glove. And then ever so gently, I tossed the ball, and it landed right into his open mitt. 
And when it hit the leather, he instinctively closed his hand and the glove did the rest. And I started screaming and shouting, great catch, Josh, great catch. My son and I had a real hoot nanny right there in the backyard. Well, the very next night when I got home from work, my son said, Dad, let's play catch. I said, okay. And then he said, so here's what we're going to do. You throw me the ball and then say, great catch, okay? (laughs) Well, to this, Dad, that was more than okay. Because kids need to know that their dad is proud of them and that we will always love them. But it's so easy, especially for us dads, to forget that. And dads, he still needs to hear that, even if your boy is fully grown and big enough to eat baled hay. He does. If Jesus needed to hear what he heard from his father after everything he had given up, including all the prerogatives of deity itself, I mean, Jesus had set aside all of that just to fulfill the mission his father had given to him. So, of course, Jesus was over the moon thrilled because of his father's spoken love and affirmation. However, boom, immediately after that moment, Jesus is swept away into the desert to be tempted. Now, you look at your text. That happened in the very next verse. Isn't it stunning how great temptation typically follows right on the heels of a great blessing? You'll find it often in Scripture where God's beloved servant experiences a transformative high and holy moment only to be followed by a breathtaking plunge into a dark valley. Take Moses. He had just spent 40 days up on the mountain, all alone, just Moses and God, in the presence of God. And so he finally comes down, because not even Moses could stay up on that mountain, but his face is still glowing because of God's glory. But before the man even got off the mountain, what does he see? He sees all of Israel, and they're dancing. Most of them are dancing naked and just dancing around this golden idol shaped like a cow. No wonder his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hand, broke them to pieces. Then there's Elijah, armed with the power of God. He had just won this amazing battle, not only against Baal, but against 800 of his prophets. Against incredible odds, fire came down from heaven, and Elijah and his God won. And the whole countryside shouted, The Lord, He is God! But then immediately after that, Queen Jezebel threatened to take his life, and Elijah folded like a little bitty baby. He was so defeated, he even pled with God to just take his life. One more. The Apostle Paul received from God what was an exceedingly great vision, his words. Well, I'd say so. He said that he got caught up into the third heaven, whatever that is, and he received some revelation that were too wonderful for him to even speak about. And everybody said, wow. But to keep Paul from getting all uppity about what he saw, God gave him a thorn in the flesh. We don't know a lot about that thorn. There are a lot of guesses. But evidently it was so bad, Paul pleaded three times for God to take it away. Three times God said no. Folks, that's how the story goes. Way up, but then just as far back down. An awesome experience followed by a devastating experience. High and holy moment, but then an equally dark and difficult moment. That's the human experience. 
and why the Bible says, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And that anyone includes Jesus. He had just been baptized. Remember how you felt when you got baptized? His excitement, though, was even more loud and proud because his true identity had just been publicly celebrated by his father. Can you imagine how that must have felt? And yet Luke tells us that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, a feeling that came because of the baptism, returned from the Jordan, that's where he was baptized, and was led by the Spirit into the desert. Why? Matthew's already told us why, to be tempted. And you get the sense that Jesus knew why. And I would think, struggling with some degree of anxiety, just knowing that the only reason he's going into those woods is to be tempted. Mm. And so for the next 40 days, Jesus is tempted. But get this, he's tempted by the devil himself. Not a JV demon. We're talking El Diablo himself. The big guy. The one and only Beelzebub has come to the desert to circumvent the mission of the promised one. Who knows what Jesus is about to walk into? All he knows for sure is that Satan's stated mission is and always has been to disrupt and if possible to derail the holy mission of God. So let's read it together. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those 40 days, which means Jesus was fasting, all right? Understand, this was a fast, not a cleanse. A cleanse probably happened, but the purpose of Jesus' fast was purely spiritual. A time when he is saying to his father, and no doubt also to himself, Father, you are far better than food. In fact, you are all I need. You are what I desire above all created things. I am after only you. I live my life only for you. That's why I'm temporarily setting aside my own gratification, something as, as essential as my appetite, as a declar de declaration of my honor and my loyalty only to you. Now, please indulge me if this next sentence is a bit too deep for you. But after 40 days without food, the Bible says that he was hungry. Just drink that in. You think? But don't miss the important part of what Luke just said. At the end of those 40 days. Meaning what? The fast was over. The 40 days had ended. And that's when the devil showed up and said to Jesus. Now time out. Before we dive into what Satan said to Jesus. I want to spend just a few moments talking about how it is that temptation happens. Because the way Satan tempted Jesus is essentially the same way he tempts you and me. And the interesting thing about Satan's temptation strategy is, although Satan always plays dirty, he also always fights predictably. In other words, Satan is not a very creative guy. And evidently, he doesn't have to be. All the way back in the first century A.D., the Apostle John revealed Satan's playbook. And now, over 2,000 years later, not one word has changed. I want you to hear this. 
Do not love the world or anything in the world. Because if anyone does love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, here we go. For everything in the world, which includes the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, all that stuff, that comes not from the Father, but from the world. Every single day, our minds are bombarded with sights and sounds all designed so that these three appetites are fulfilled. And every human, we all have all three of these in spades. We have sinful cravings, we have lustful appetites, and we have the prideful boasting of whatever it is that we have and whatever it is that we do. And so when Satan offers us temptations based on those three realities, and every temptation is, those temptations produce within us desires and feelings and longings that make us want to act on those random desires, feelings, and longings. And that, folks, That is where the battle is always fought. James says each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Now that word enticed is a very descriptive word. It appears just one other time in scripture. And the picture is of a juicy worm dangling and wiggling in front of a hungry and very stupid fish. But it's not the bait that's the problem. It's the fish's own inner cravings that make him bite that bait. That's the problem. And so while Satan might use all sorts of bait to cause you to want to bite every temptation that you face, and I'm, I mean every single one of them, is based on one of these three types but they all are sourced. They all come from within you. That bait either tempts the cravings of your own desires. Now, these desires may be the need to eat, the need to drink, the need to express our sexual desires or our drives. These can all be satisfied in a good and proper way. But the drive for food can become gluttony. The drive for sleep can become laziness. And the sex drive, when not expressed between a man and a woman within the marital relationship, that is sin. However, Satan might also use certain bait to tempt the lust of your eyes. Anybody experience that? Now, lust speaks to your mind to your imagination, to your innermost thoughts. So when you constantly think of possessions that you wish you had, or when you look at porn that, and ponder what it would be like if you could be with her instead of her, you're, you're toying around with bait that you have no right dabbling in. Or maybe your temptation is based on the boasting of what you have or what you can do. Or maybe you're sitting here thinking, well, you know, I don't do porn. I don't live in some fantasy world either like those losers. No, but you are guilty of boasting about your bad self. And that boasting is a powerful bait that can just as effectively keep you from following close after Christ. Two other things you ought to know about Satan's bait. First, The bait that works for you won't necessarily work for me. And second, you wanting to bite the bait, that's not sin. It's only sin when you actually take the bait. However, if you keep feeding your ego based on those three temptations, and if you keep thinking about what it would be like to embrace whatever it is the bait for you that that works on you, 
you will in time start wanting to bite the bait and ultimately you keep wanting and you will bite the bait. Take Eve, for example. When she was tempted to eat the fruit, the serpent put all three of these approaches on the hook to get her to bite. Genesis 3, 6 says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, that's the sinful craving part, and pleasing to the eye, so she used her God-given eyes to lust, to long for it, and she also saw that it was desirable for gaining wisdom, so there's the boasting part. What did she do then, sports fans? She took some and ate it. Of course she did. If you play with temptation long enough, that is what always happens. Do you know who else was tempted in all three of these realms? Jesus. And that's what this series is all about. We're going to take our time and we're going to examine each of these three waves of temptation based on the words of John. And all of that came from Jesus after Jesus' baptism and after that amazing affirmation and after 40 days of spiritual connection in the desert. That's when, after that high holy moment, when Satan's wave number one of what would become three waves, in wave number one, the devil came to Jesus And look at it. He said to him, feeling kind of hungry there, Mr. Son of God? I think he was. So here's what I'm thinking, Jesus. If you really are the Son of God, then eat up. Tell this stone to become bread. We both know you can. But Jesus somehow kept his hunger in check, and he said no. And then he explained why. In fact, in every wave of temptation, Jesus explains, and it's always the same thing. It is written. And it was. Not just any old place. It was written in Scripture. Every response to temptation was a quotation of Scripture. In every face of every temptation, Jesus reacted the same way every time. He said, I'm not going to do that, dragon man, because my father says that people do not live on bread alone. And Matthew says that Jesus also said, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Moses was the first to use that phrase, man does not live on bread alone. It's something that he said just before he died, as he was trying to remind the Israelites of everything God had done for them. Listen, and how the Lord your God led you all the way through the desert, how he humbled you, causing you to hunger, but then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known. Why did he do that? To teach you. That man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, the problem for Israel is they had just spent 40 years believing that man does live by bread alone. Remember that slavery in Egypt? Their only job for 400 years was to build these huge storehouses just to keep the grain that made the bread. And the more storehouses they built, the more storehouses Pharaoh wanted. Because, of course, how can you know when enough is enough? They learned because Egyptian culture had taught them, do whatever you got to do to make sure you got enough. Make more slaves, even, which they did. Just make sure you've got enough bread. And so God leads them into the wilderness to teach them something that was diametrically opposed to everything they had learned back in Egypt. The message was don't trust in bread. If you put trust 
in having enough bread, just like Pharaoh, there will never be enough bread. So instead, put your trust in me, not bread, me. And I promise, I will provide for your every need. I don't know if you've noticed, but the world tries real hard to convince us that we are the sum of what we have. Or in these terms, we really do live by bread alone. However, when the Bible teaches about bread, it's not the stuff that we make toast out of. Instead, it, it's a symbol of the sustenance of life. What we need to sustain life. The world says, find your worth in the things you can accumulate. And don't ever let an appetite pass without finding some way to satisfy it. Hang your whole identity, in fact, on having pretty stuff. Great car, fine house, good job, a closet full of clothes, whatever. And the thing is, every last one of us, we have... We've all been sucked into that siren call so that we too long for more and, and, and more. A woman's husband had just done the bills and there was no cushion for any random purchases till next pay period. In fact, as she's heading out the door to go shopping, he said, hey, it's okay to look, but don't buy. Yes, dear. Yet hours later, she comes home loaded with packages which lit him up. He said, I thought we agreed you would look but not buy. She said, I know, but then I saw this outfit and tried it on. And when I did, the devil said, wow, that looks good on you. <laughs> right then and there, you should have said, get thee behind me, Satan. She said, I did. But when he got behind me, he said, looks good from back here, too. <laughs> My point is, whatever you feed on, whatever bread alone looks to you, that's the voice that you're going to hear. But I agree with this author. He says, when we live by bread alone, there is never enough bread. Not even when we make so much of it, some of it rots away. When we live by bread alone, every bite we take leaves a bitter aftertaste. And the more we eat, the more bitter the taste. And when we live by bread alone, we always want more and better bread. How true is that? And yet that's the world's bait. You are what you have. So if you don't have very much, you're not much. Besides, even the things you do have, it's not enough, and it's certainly not good enough. After my sophomore year in college, I, I worked an entire summer for hours upon hours so that I could pay for my tuition for the next year and buy my first car. And I did, <laughs> but only barely. I covered school first. And I had $1,200 left to buy something with four wheels and a motor. It was a 10-year-old Dodge Coronet, a total beater, but it got me places. So when I got back to school, having a car, I met this girl named Donna. <clears throat> First time we went out, I was kind of embarrassed about my old heap because, you know, she was pretty and from glitzy Akron, Ohio, and... So, so I did. I apologized for having a crummy set of wheels. You know what she said to me? <laughs> she said, it's all right. I've never been all that attracted to guys who are either into their cars or their bodies. <laughs> she... She said, I'm drawn to you because, uh, get this, I don't like guys with either great-looking cars or really great bodies. <laughs> oh, um, thank you. <laughs> but that's our world, people. It has always been our world. You are what you have. 
But what you have, bread or otherwise, it's still never enough. Because whatever you do have, if that is your ultimate focus, you're always going to wish you had more. Are you with me? Let's go back to Jesus' response. He had just spent 40 days in the desert, all alone, no food. He's 30 years old, still hasn't begun his life's calling. And the primary desire of his heart in that moment was so very easy to understand. He needed food. He also needed adequate resources to get his mission underway. Plus, he needed a spark that might help him get noticed. Very routine, very simple desires. The same desires any entrepreneur would need to have. Today it's food. How did Satan handle this food desire? Jesus, I can't imagine you haven't eaten for 40 days. You mean your heavenly Father sent you out to this wilderness to starve? Well then, he surely wouldn't mind if you turned, I don't know, a couple of these stones into dinner rolls. He's not that cruel, is he? So what do you say, Jesus? Let's do a little rock into roll. Now, I, I apologize. I... <laughs> Now, don't kid yourself. Jesus' stomach was beyond growling. He was quite literally starving. His routine desire for food could easily become a runaway desire. And yet Jesus tamped down Satan's deception, and he did it by quoting Scripture. In fact, every time he gets tempted, he resists his temptation the same way. However... Let me be clear, although I believe passionately in the power that is the Word of God, I don't believe that Jesus was simply using these verses as some kind of magical incantation to ward off the boogeyman. I also don't believe that he just repeated these words over and again as a sort of mantra for victory. Abba is better than bread. Abba is better. No, no, no. God's word is so much more than a collection of incantations. God's word is truth. And more than just truth, God's word is also living and active. And it's able to penetrate and, yes, even judge every person's heart. And that's how real change happens. When you fill your mind with God's mind, and then as the psalmist says, when you meditate on it both day and night, and not just meditate, but also memorize it, as David said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's there where the true power resides. I remember it as clearly as it, as if it had happened yesterday. I was a young man and I was struggling with temptation. And more than struggling, I was losing battle after battle after battle. But one day I came across 1 Corinthians 10.13, which promises that whenever you are tempted, as I clearly was, God has promised that he will provide a way out so that I could stand up under it. I didn't know that. And neither did I know how he would do that. But I was tired of thinking about stuff that I shouldn't ought to be thinking about. And not just thinking, but doing it. It was killing me to the point I wondered if I'd ever overcome but I couldn't get away from that verse. It promised me God would help me overcome. He would provide me a way out. And so I had a study Bible, and I looked in the margins, and it suggested that maybe I also read 2 Corinthians 
And baby, I couldn't get there fast enough. I wanted to know. I had to know if Jesus could endure all the temptation that he faced and yet never did sin. And since 1 Corinthians 10, 13 said, I don't have to sin either. Come on, Bible. Tell me how. And here's what it said. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, but on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds and can demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Well, that sure sounded perfect for me. But hang on, there's more. With these weapons, the most powerful of them being the Word, we can actually, listen to this, Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And that was the moment when I decided I was going to spend the rest of my life filling my mind with as much of God's mind as I possibly could by reading and meditating and memorizing the words of God's book of life. One of the first verses I discovered was Psalm 119, where young David asked a question young Steve had been really struggling with. How can a young man keep his way pure? But see, David didn't just ask that question. He gave me the answer I'd been looking for. He said, by living according to your word. In fact, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, I was so tired of all my sinning, I immediately memorized that verse, and it was awesome because that verse, hidden in my heart, with it, whenever I started thinking about stuff I shouldn't ought to be thinking about, God would take that verse that I had hidden in my heart and he broke it all the way up into my brain and voila, yeah, I do have a way out. Now, I'm not saying it happened overnight and I'm certainly not saying that I did it every time I was convicted, but every night, and every morning for a whole lot of nights and mornings, I would review that verse and then I would ask God, today, Lord, would you please bring these words to my mind whenever I start thinking stupid again? And he did. God did. I'd like to tell you I listened every time, but that wasn't the case. But over time, I found a stronger strength than I ever imagined I could have. And now, though the devil, even at my age, continues to prowl around like a roaring lion, and though he's prowling after you too, and he always will be looking for someone to devour, you, as well as me, have the power to resist him. And you will resist him when you stand firm in the faith by standing upon the living word of God just like Jesus. Jesus also walked in the very same sludge where you walk. All the static that tries to distract you also tried to distract him. And it's because life is a battle. It is a life and death battle for your soul and yours and yours too. But also for the souls of all those that we both love and we long that they follow Jesus. That's, that's the bad news. It's going to continue. Here's some good news. Because Jesus submitted to the Father's will. And because he freely came to this wicked, desperately evil sludge ball. And 
because he resisted the relentless attacks that came after him once he was here with all of hell itself determined to send him back home again, utterly defeated because Jesus stood firm in the face of it all, knowing that he alone was worthy to stand in the gap for every soul and for all time, past, present, and future, and knowing also that there would be no hope, not for any of us, had he failed. But Jesus didn't fail. Oh, they killed him but not even the grave could hold him. Three short days after they were convinced they had him, (laughs) he burst out of that tomb gloriously alive. And because he lives, the victory over my sin and over your sin, that victory is already ours. Because the same Jesus who said no to Satan in the wilderness shouted, it is finished on Mount Calvary. Having disarmed every power, ruler, and authority over this world, Jesus alone rules, and he will rule both now and forevermore. Are you with me? Satan can't lay a hand on you. Not if you resist. Not if you stand firm. That doesn't mean that Satan won't do his best to convince you that he's got you, because he will. He'll throw up all kind of roadblocks, try to do anything he can to get you to throw in the towel. But listen to me. Even if you do crumble before his temptations, he's still got you. Jesus has got you. It's called forgiveness of sins. And if the cross means anything, it means that even when you totally screw up, he's got you. And he will restore you. But because all of this is made possible because of his great love for you, you you don't really want it to come to that, do you? No, you want to walk as Jesus walked. Am I right? That is the desire of your heart, right? I know it's mine. And so I'm going to ask you, would you stand with me right now, please? Stand. Come on. Because I want us to read the verses that appear on the screen. I want it to be read as an affirmation of our resolve. Please don't read it as some kind of boring thing we do in church. Because I don't want to give up. Do you? Well, then let's read these words together from God's word. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I don't want to let anything move me either. Do you? Then let's read. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so then, with the help of God and with his word as our weapon of choice, let us also read this together. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to what? Stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Got one last question. Who's with me? Lord God, we are all dirty, messed up sinners. But we want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. It is so much our passion, our desire. Lord, fill our minds with your word. Help us each one become students 
of this life-giving power that you have placed in our hands. Lord, help each one of us to seek out those verses that speak to our greatest temptation. Lord, Whatever that is, it's different for us all, but help us seek it out and perhaps even look to someone that we respect to help us so that as we fill our mind with your mind, we can stand. We can be unmovable. But Lord, in those moments when we aren't, we thank you for your grace and your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord for what Jesus did on Calvary that we celebrate now in this moment. As we take the bread, we remember his body broken. As we drink from the cup, we remember his blood spilled, not for his own sins, not for crimes he had done, but for our own. Um, Lord, may this, this simple meal be a time of declaration of our desire to be like him. In the name of Jesus.